Hello and welcome to another episode of a podcast about murder. I'm Jem and I'm here with Freya. How are you doing today? Good, although I've had a really bad cough um, for the last four or five days. So like hopefully my voice isn't too grating. Um, and also if I have a coughing fit, I mean, obviously it will be edited out, but <laughs> no, leave it in fully. <laughs> but so, you know, um, that might happen for these uncontrollable okay. fits of like spasming <laughs> chest is just unbelievable. It's unreal. <laughs> it's horrible. But yeah, so hopefully my voice is okay. Okay. Well, you're not the main speaker for this, so it should be... Okay, all right. <laughs> no, but I mean, it shouldn't put too much stress on your... Yeah. yeah. You're not the main attraction today, love. I mean, <laughs> you. I, we barely need you for this. <laughs> <laughs> In today's episode, we're going to discuss one of Scotland's oldest unsolved cases, the case of a serial killer known as Bible John. As a warning, our discussion of this case will touch on acts of extreme violence towards women, including rape. If you would understandably like to give this episode a miss due to its subject matter, then we will see you next week. Between 1968 and 1969, three women who frequented the Barrowland Ballroom, a dance hall in Glasgow, were found murdered. Sadly, these murders were a reflection of the times. Murder rates in Scotland had increased dramatically in the 1960s, and Glasgow had a particularly high crime rate. Glasgow was apparently known as the most deprived area in Britain, and had a high murder rate, as well as many other social issues, such as extreme poverty and mass unemployment, and gang terrorism was also widespread during this time. Glasgow's residents lived in fairly dismal conditions. Many of the buildings had been bombed during the war and were still in states of disrepair. Many districts didn't have access to hot water, in the BBC Scotland documentary The Hunt for Bible John, which I watched in preparation for this episode, they point out the importance of dance halls, which offered people a form of escapism from their everyday lives. Right. In 1968, Patricia Docker was a 25-year-old auxiliary nurse who worked at Minskirk Hospital. She had married a man named Alexander Docker five years prior in 1963. The two had had a son, also named Alex, in 1964. In 1968, their marriage wasn't doing well. Her husband was a corporal stationed at RAF Digby in Lincolnshire, while Patricia and their son had moved back to live with her parents in Battlefield, an area in the south of Glasgow. A place just called Battlefield, straight up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very intimidating. <laughs> the couple were discussing divorce. On February 22nd, 1968, Patricia Docker planned to go out for the evening. She told her parents that she was going to a place called the Majestic Ballroom in the city centre, but she actually ended up going to the Barrowland Ballroom. While many believe that Patricia may have simply changed her mind over the course of the evening, others speculate that she may have planned to go to Barrowland all along and had lied to her parents about her destination that evening, as she didn't want them to worry about her due to the Barrowland's reputation. Hmm. The Barrowland Ballroom regularly hosted an over-25s night on Thursdays, which may have been what drew Patricia to it. This over-25s night had a slightly scandalous reputation, as many people would go there in order to commit adultery. This led to many people using fake names so as not to be identified, which led to an overabundance of men named John, for instance. <laughs> this will become an extremely relevant detail, yes, as you'll see. Yes, I, I can imagine. <laughs> the police's investigation would be severely hindered by this confusion over Patricia's whereabouts that evening, as well as people's reluctance to come forward as witnesses, as they didn't want to admit to being at the Barrowland, with the implication that they were cheating on their spouses. When Patricia didn't return home that night, her parents assumed that she had spent the night at a friend's. On the morning of February 23rd, however, her body was discovered by a man on his way to work in the doorway of a garage in Carmichael Place, Battlefield, very close to her parents' house. Her clothes, handbag and watch were missing. The watch was later found in a pool of water not far from the site where her body was discovered, and the handbag was found in a nearby river. Her clothes, however, were never found, with the exception of a single shoe found not far from her body. So I'm just, um, I'm speculating based off of the fact that she isn't found far from her parents' house, that she did leave the, that she was on her way home mm -hmm. when she was attacked. 
so yeah. she sort of made it out of the uh, and at least a decent ways through her journey yes so as we'll see with the other two victims of this case they're often found not far from where they live hmm. so there's an idea that they leave the ballroom with their killer right who follows them back home and then kills them before they can actually get into their house okay Patricia was completely naked and had suffered blunt force trauma to the head. The markings around her throat led police to believe that she had been strangled to death. Upon interviewing neighbours in the area, they found that people had heard a woman scream, leave me alone, the previous evening. Mm, not a great thing no. to scream. She was identified by an ambulance driver who came to pick up the body, and her identity was then confirmed by her father the following day. Her autopsy was performed by Gilbert Forbes, he confirmed police suspicions that her cause of death was strangulation, possibly with a belt. The police determined that Patricia had been attacked following her departure from the dance hall. The assailant had likely started attacking her on her way home, beating her face. Mm. Patricia was then raped and strangled to death. It was also noted that she had been menstruating at the time of her death, a detail that we will come to see may be of some significance. Police were able to eliminate her husband as a suspect, as he had been seen at a military base at the time of her murder, and therefore had a solid alibi. Based on her parents' account of Patricia's plans for the evening, police initially believed her to have spent the entire evening at the Majestic Ballroom. This meant that they only learned that she had actually spent the majority of her evening at the Barrowland Ballroom several weeks into their investigation, meaning that any potential leads had gone cold. Mm. The police had very little to go off, as there weren't any eyewitnesses to the crime, nor any hard evidence. The investigation into Patricia's murder quickly went cold. One of the other key issues to keep in mind is that Glaswegians at this time generally didn't view the police as trustworthy, which adds another layer of reluctance to come forward with any information that may have helped the case. Over a year later, on August 17th, 1969, Jemima MacDonald would meet a tragically similar fate to Patricia. She had decided to spend the evening of the 16th at the Barrowland, which she apparently went to quite regularly. In the week before her murder, Jemima had gone to the Barrowland on several occasions, and it is thought that her killer may have identified her as a potential target during this time. Jemima was 31 years old and was the mother to three children. Her sister, Margaret O'Brien, was looking after them on the night of her death. Jemima and her sister usually went out together, but her sister had reportedly decided to remain home that night following an argument with her husband. Jemima went alone to the Barrowland. That evening, Jemima was seen talking to a man presumed to be between the age of 25 and 35, approximately six foot tall. He notably spoke with a distinctive Glaswegian accent and referenced the Bible during their conversation. That'll be where the name comes from then. Yep. <laughs> We're putting two and two together here. I'm getting there. I'm catching up. <laughs> it's taken a while, but... <laughs> the pieces are all coming together. The pictures are getting clearer. The two were seen leaving the ballroom together shortly after midnight, heading in the direction of Jemima's house. Having not heard from her sister all evening, Margaret was worried for Jemima's well-being. Her fears were compounded by rumours that a body had been found in a derelict building by local children the next day. Hmm. She decided to check Again, it out. Again, it's one of those things where, like... Can you imagine being a child and coming across, like, a dead body? Yeah. That's just lifelong scarring. Yeah. Like, we've had, we've seen that before in a couple of other things, and it always just makes me think, oh my god, how do you, like... How do you, like... How do you get over that or yeah. process that? Margaret decided to check it out for herself and discovered her sister's badly beaten body lying face down. Unlike Patricia, Jemima was still mostly fully clothed. Only her shoes and stockings had been removed. There were several similarities between her and Patricia that police immediately noticed. The examination of her body revealed that she had been strangled to death with her own stockings. Her clothing had also been torn, indicating the levels of extreme violence she had suffered at the hands of her attacker. Both women had gone to the barrel and ballroom the night before their murders. Both had been raped and beaten around the face before being strangled to death. Both had been menstruating, and both had had their handbags stolen. Hmm. So lots of, of similarities. Yes. Um, down to, like, really small details. Yeah. Despite the similarities between the two women's murders, police did not initially believe them to have been perpetrated by the same individual. Unfortunately... That's madness to me. 
<laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Well, but okay. I mean, how often were women being raped and murdered? I guess in this area, maybe it was. I mean, maybe it was not uncommon. As I was saying before, it's like Glasgow at the time is an extremely dangerous place to hmm. live. So maybe this is slightly less um, uncommon. But the details still. being so similar. But I think it's also um, not in your best interest to have a serial killer going around. Like mm. it's more, you'd want to believe that two separate it's incidents happened random. where a woman was killed by someone she knew. Yeah. You wouldn't want to think, oh shit, we've got to go and find a serial yeah. killer now whose patterns we now have to suss out, whose motivations we don't know. Yeah. Uh, and that will frighten the public and so on. So, yeah, I can understand, like, maybe being reluctant to want to accept that it could be a serial killer. Was well, at this stage as well, it's like this is a year later. Right. And there's only been two murders. So. I think it's not happening close enough together that they're like, oh, this is definitely the same person, nor in such numbers that it's, like, undeniable. Right. Unfortunately, the scene of Jemima's murder had been severely contaminated by members of the community who had even moved the body before the police arrived, therefore likely destroying a lot of potential evidence that could have helped the investigation. Over the course of their investigation, police interviewed dancers at the club, although patrons were just as reluctant to talk to the police as they had been during the investigation of Patricia's murder. They would also go to the ballroom undercover and ask various women if they had had any bad experiences at the club, hoping this would turn up a promising lead. Eventually, on August 20th, a witness came forward and provided police with a description of the man seen with Jemima on the night of her murder. Based on this description, they were able to produce a composite sketch, which was distributed by the media. This was the first time a composite sketch had been distributed to the public in Scotland, but it ultimately didn't turn up any new leads. Female police officers were also sent to the Barrel and Ballroom undercover in an attempt to lure the killer out of hiding, but these attempts were also unsuccessful. The case slowly went cold, and the police presence at the Barrel and dwindled. On October 30th, 1969, 29-year-old Helen Puttock and her sister Jean Langford went out to the Barrel and. Helen was married with two young sons. David was five years old, while Michael was 18 months old. Helen's husband, George, voiced his concerns about his wife and sister-in-law going out by themselves, but was reassured by his mother-in-law that the two frequently went out and there was nothing to worry about. George nonetheless gave the two money for a taxi so that they could get home safely. He sounds nice. Like, you know, he's, he's worried about them going out, but at the end of the day, he's like, yeah, they deserve to have a little fun. Here's money for a, for a cab. Well, it's also like... Um, it's nice. Not... It doesn't seem to be, like, controlling, like, I don't want you going out dancing yeah, with other men. It's no, more I, like... I oh. see it as concern for safety rather yeah. than, um, like, rather than trying to stop her have freedom. Mm. Um, it's just really sad that his worries happen to be founded in you know something yeah. did happen so it's like you know it just it makes me sad that historically and to this day women aren't free to have fun yeah like no matter where they kind of are um it's the freedom to sort of go out and have fun at night has been hampered mm. um in a way that isn't for men um and it's sad it's really sad and the documentary specifically talks to uh george and he sort of gives a lot of his sort of um memories of this time and how this has affected his life up until now even mm. so yeah well it would you yeah never forget at the barrel and helen and jean met two men who both went by quote unquote john and right. um, so you know i think these guys could get a little creative i mean if you're making up an identity like have fun with it totally <laughs> like no one's gonna know if you if the whole point of coming here is to sort of shake off normal life and be someone else because either, whether whether it's because you're trying to have an affair or not is like you know come, come up with something fun yeah but i guess the, the other artemis thing is ogle like... tree <laughs> <laughs> i guess the other thing is like if you use a ludicrously uncommon name people are going to remember you like, even if it's not your real name, you're going to stand out. So yeah. if everyone's John, 
So if someone's like, oh, who did she go home with? John. That could be like a hundred guys. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, So Helen and her sister met these two men who were both going by the name John. The four spent the evening chatting and dancing before deciding to leave. Jean's dance partner separated from the group, while Helen's dance partner remained with the sisters and hailed a cab, following George's advice. Jean was dropped off at her home in Knightswood, while Helen and the man known as John remained in the cab, heading to Helen's home in Scotston together. The next morning, on October 31st, a man walking his dog would discover Helen's body in the garden behind her flat. Helen's body bore the signs of an assault similar to the two victims previously discussed. She was badly beaten around the face, had been raped and strangled to death with her own stockings. Investigators could tell that she had put up a fight due to the grass stains on her feet. They could also tell that she had tried to escape her attacker by attempting to climb up the nearby fence and running up the embankment before being dragged back. She bore a deep bite mark on her right thigh. She had been struck with a heavy object around the head. Her handbag had been stolen, although its contents had been spread around her body. She had also been menstruating at the time of her murder, and the killer had deliberately placed her pad under her left arm. Strange. Do you feel like I'm? Like, it seems to me that they're getting more extreme? Each time it seems to be getting more extreme and more elaborate. Like, this one has all of her stuff laid out around her and has been, like, staged in some way. Hmm. Which is kind of different to the other two. So, Helen's murder started the longest-running manhunt in Scottish history. Over the course of their investigation, police confirmed a potential link with the previous two murders. All three women were married and had children, had gone to the barrel and ballroom on the night of their respective deaths. Their handbags were all missing from the crime scenes. They had all been sexually assaulted prior to their murder. They had all been killed not far from their homes. And they had all been menstruating at the time of their deaths and detectives believe that this may have somehow triggered the murderer's rage. Hmm. Police developed a profile for the man they were searching for. Much of the information regarding the killer comes from Jean's eyewitness account. Jean recounted that a man, a cut above the others, had asked her sister to dance. He gave his name as John. As the group were leaving, he and Helen had stopped to get cigarettes from a cigarette machine. The machine was apparently malfunctioning as it took their money without dispensing cigarettes. And according to Jean, this had caused John to fly into a rage, calling clubs like the Barrowland, quote, dens of iniquity. During the 20-minute cab ride to her house, Jean had gleaned a lot of information about her sister's future killer. She said that he spoke a little about his life, but remained quite reserved during the journey. He reportedly quoted from the Bible, although she was unable to remember exactly what he had quoted. At some point, he asked Jean and Helen if they were married, to which they replied that they were. He then asked them if they knew what happened to adulterous women in the Bible. Hmm. When they replied that they did not, he said they were stoned to death. Factual. Um, <laughs> threatening, but factual. I mean, at this point, I'd be like, mm, I need to find a way out of this conversation. Yeah. Uh, no, definitely. <laughs> it's definitely like not a conversation that would fill me with like a feeling of safety or confidence <laughs> but sure Jean noted that the man's two front teeth crossed over and that he was missing one of his back teeth she described him as tall and well-dressed between 25 and 30 years old he gave his name as John although she couldn't quite remember his last name either Templeton Sempelson or Emerson he was well-spoken and explained that he refrained from drinking alcohol because he had received a very strict upbringing. He reportedly told the two of them, I don't drink at Hogmanay, I pray. Yeah, this, yeah, strange dude. Yeah. Um, you like, don't want to get more... tangled up in the guy who, like, comes to the club just to criticise like, it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like going to a place and meeting a guy and then him being like, well, actually... I hate everything about this place. And, and people who come here are And the wrong. people who come here. Yeah. And you're just like, okay, at this point I'd be wanting to find a way out of like any interaction with this person. While Jean described his hair colour as reddish or fair, Bouncers at the Barrowland claimed that the well-spoken man had black hair. Additionally... That's quite a difference. That is. I will say it is night time, so like... Mm. Anything could be possible, I guess. 
they could also i don't know i don't know how likely it is that they might be talking about two completely different people but Mm. possible it is quite a difference between black and like reddish hair Additionally, the bouncers described him as short, which went against Jean's description of the man as tall. A lot of uncertainty and conflicting accounts start to emerge regarding this man's appearance, which also, you know, doesn't help the investigation. The last sighting of the man matching Jean's description was by the driver of a night bus. At approximately 2am on October 31st, the driver saw a disheveled man with mudstains on his jacket and a red mark beneath one eye. The driver saw him walking towards the public ferry to cross the River Clyde. Based on Jean's description, police produced a portrait of the killer which was distributed to the press and spread across the country. In 1970, a second portrait was produced using the photo fit system. This was the first time this method had been used in a murder investigation in Scotland. This led to hundreds of new leads as people came forward to report people they knew as matching the picture, but none of these leads actually contributed much to the investigation. So many people were being reported that police even had to start giving out official cards to people who bore a strong resemblance to the killer and had already been interrogated by the police that read, I am not Bible John. So that people, you know, people were repeatedly being reported and had already been checked out and deemed innocent by the police. Unfortunately, no other significant eyewitnesses ever came forward. As the man described by Jean had unusually short hair for the time, the police decided to interview all local hairdressers in the hopes of identifying him. They also interviewed all dentists, asking for records of a man with overlapping front teeth, but neither of these efforts provided any new leads. Police collected over 50,000 witness statements and went door-to-door to investigate, questioning over 5,000 suspects over the course of the first year of the investigation, although none of these led anywhere. Police noted the suspect's knowledge of police procedure, The state in which he had left the bodies of his victims suggested that he had acted in ways that he knew would slow the investigation by disfiguring the victims and taking their belongings, thereby delaying the time it would take to identify them. He also left very little physical DNA evidence at the scene. Furthermore, it seemed as if the suspect had a relatively good knowledge of the areas he had been operating in, but strangely, none of the locals seemed to recognise him based on their description and the composite sketch provided by the police. Detectives would mingle with dancers at dance halls, thinking that the murderer would strike again, but he never did. Hmm. An extensive psychological profile of the killer was established, based on Jean's testimony, which was even made public in the hopes of someone coming forward with a new lead. Desperate for new leads in a case that was steadily growing colder, police even turned to alternative methods. Jean underwent hypnosis in order to try to uncover further memories of the evening, and a famous Belgian clairvoyant was even hired to help detectives in their investigation. A famous Belgian clairvoyant? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Which, you know, make of that what you will, but ultimately he didn't really bring anything to this investigation. Shocker. (laughs) (laughs) Ultimately, however, the person responsible for the horrific murders of Helen Puttock, Jemima MacDonald and Patricia Docker was never found. Wow. So we're going to get into some of the theories surrounding this case. As the case grew cold, detectives believed that John may have either left the country, died, or been arrested on an unrelated charge. Which sounds pretty plausible to me. But again, it's just like the broadest possible theory you could have. Yeah, I I like, (laughs) uh, I mean... I always think when there is a serial killer and they never, they seem, they appear to stop killing. Mm. There is like, there is no, I don't think it's common for serial killers to simply stop their behavior of their own accord. I think they either are incarcerated, they die or they move somewhere else. Um, Mm. That is, yeah, that's the only thing that, that really makes sense. Yeah. Another theory that emerged was that John was in the military and had committed his crimes while on leave. Hmm. Subsequently, police checked all of the crews of ships docked at Glasgow during the time of the murders to no avail. But I do think that that theory makes sense because it's someone who comes into Glasgow but is not, so would be familiar with it, but not living there. 
I could be wrong, but didn't someone say that he had a Glaswegian accent? He though? did have a Glaswegian accent. This was the man so seen sure talking to that. Jemima McDonald, I think. Well, okay. So, you know, that's just one sighting. So maybe it's maybe he doesn't have that accent. But if he does... Well, this is the other thing is that he seems to be... He behaves as if he's a local Glaswegian because he knows mm. the areas that he's operating in so he can, like, get away from the scenes relatively quickly without being seen yes so that suggests that it's not someone who is unfamiliar with the territory Mm -hmm. but you would think that if this is a local committing these crimes that someone at some point would be like i know who that is maybe i understand why they're looking at that as a theory but i think i feel um because this is just a feeling but i feel that it's a local yeah uh and that Again, he's either died, been incarcerated, or moved away. Mm. And that's why the killings stopped. have stopped. Or appear to have stopped. Others theorise that the man had been a monk or priest due to his proclivity for quoting the Bible. Although many also point out that being able to quote the Bible was much less remarkable at the time. Yeah. As most people would have a decent working knowledge of the Bible. Yeah, and also, like, there's no, like, to be a sort of zealot there's no reason why you have to be like um a A priest priest necessarily you can be just like a bit overzealous in your religious yeah i suppose maybe the appeal of this theory is that he's sort of part of a very secluded community that he would like he'd be sneaking out from i guess if he's a monk he would be living in a sort of monastery somewhere oh right so you're saying that if he's like that it might make sense then to, that he would be harder to find yes. because he would have a very small social circle. He's from like an isolated community. Yeah. Okay. I I, I guess. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary. Though, no. To, yeah. Some believe that police had actually correctly identified the killer, but didn't have enough evidence to actually charge him. Hmm. meaning that he ultimately went free but so believers of this theory sort of think they knew who he was and they had like found him but they just weren't ever able to charge him yeah i mean it seems like if you were this guy does seem like he sticks out in the sense of like what he says Mm. um so you'd think that maybe if you were doing loads of interviews with people who frequented the club Mm. um that you would eventually figure out maybe who this guy was but maybe just not have yeah that that could that could make sense to me yeah others still believe that bible john may have been a police officer and this could explain how he seemed to have so much information about police procedure which he would have been able to use to destroy most physical evidence at the crime scenes yeah but i don't know obviously there are a lot of issues with police abusing their positions of power in society but I think there was so much attention on this case that if he, even if he had been a police officer, at some point someone would have been suspicious of him. I don't know. Police are more like, tend to be more known in their communities as well. Mm. So like any strange behavior around his family or friends would maybe have been easier to pick up. I don't know. But then on the other hand, as we as I was saying earlier, there's this general distrust of the police. So like, mm. even if you think a police officer is like behaving in a way that's not great, like who are you going to report that to? <laughs> right. During the years after the Bible John case, numerous women came forward stating that they had been sexually assaulted at the Barrowland. Hmm. One of them, Hannah Martin, claimed that she had been raped by Bible John and had actually given birth to his child in 1970. Oh, God. Damn. I I was going to bring this up, actually, because I was going to say that it feels like perhaps this guy is a rapist. Like, that's Mm. his main thing. And then when he attacks someone and discovers that they are on their period... That pushes this for him some into reason like... creates this rage, like you know, makes him mm. drives him to kill the person rather than, um, well, apparently he also rapes them, but you know, it just creates 
yeah. this anger in him for whatever reason. Probably, I'm going to go ahead and say that it's some twisted religious reason. Oh, probably. Some weird justification of misogyny. Because she's, like, unclean. <laughs> yeah. You know, that kind of thing. I would see... That does seem plausible to me, that... And then... And so I was going to say, now I'm expecting stories of women who were raped but not killed Mm. because they would have not been on their period and thus not triggered this like insane barrage of violence oh not that not that being raped isn't violent in itself obviously that is an incredible show of violence but this extra yeah which is also i don't think they ever identified or made public what the item was that he used to beat them around the head was which i would Mm. be curious to know because it has to be something that he's able to carry on him without it being noticed by other people Mm. unless he's happens to find something on location all three times but that seems unlikely to me Mm. anyway um, so Hannah Martin claimed that she had been raped by Bible John and had given birth to his child in 1970. She had initially left the ballroom voluntarily with a man who became more aggressive during the drive to her house. Some believe that her daughter may be a means of identifying Bible John due to their alleged shared DNA. Hmm. Although whether or not she was actually assaulted by Bible John is obviously difficult to confirm whether this was indeed the same person or just another violent yeah. rapist. Hmm. And unfortunately, like, it's not like that kind of thing would have been so rare. Yeah. That it has to be the same was, person. Yeah, that it had to be the same person. Um, it's, it's definitely not set in stone. Mm. So I'm now going to discuss some of the main suspects of this case. Starting with John White. So a man going by the alias John White was arrested after being seen arguing with a woman at the Barrowland Ballroom. The fact that he had provided police with an alias rather than his real name was seen as suspicious. Hmm. Although investigators at the time thought he was one of their best suspects yet, he was ultimately released from custody as he did not have the distinctive overlapping teeth from Jean's description. I'm sorry, the distinctive? Overlapping teeth. I thought you said overlapping teat. <laughs> I was like, what is an overlapping teat? What is that? How would she know about it? When you say overlapping teeth, do you mean an overbite? No, so the two front oh, teeth Oh, you mean crowding, cross crowding. Over. Right, right. Former Detective Chief Inspector Les Brown maintained that he believed that this man was the perpetrator of the Bible John killings in his autobiography. This then actually prompted the man known as John White to come forward in 2005 and provide a DNA sample that eliminated him as a suspect. Hmm. In 1986, an anonymous caller informed police that his friend was Bible John, stating that the two of them had visited the Barrowland Ballroom in the 1960s. The person identified by the caller was found to be living in the Netherlands, married to a Dutch woman. Nothing more has come from this lead. So obviously police didn't find him so suspicious that they, like, charged him with anything. Okay. In 1996, police exhumed the body of a man named John Irvine McInnes. He had committed suicide in 1980 and was related to one of the original suspects of the investigation. Police took a DNA sample to compare it to the semen samples taken from the Helen Puttock murder. Although the results were inconclusive, McInnes was officially cleared of any involvement in the murders. One of the most popular suspects is convicted serial killer and rapist Peter Tobin. Supporters of this theory point out the physical resemblance between a young Peter Tobin and the composite sketch, as well as the fact that Tobin moved around a lot, often living either in Scotland or the south of England throughout the course of his life. So he would sort of have a knowledge of the area but then not necessarily always be living there. Which would kind of make sense for this the profile of this person who seems to know Glasgow a lot, but is not recognised by the community. Okay, I think I've heard of Peter Tobin, but I don't know the details of, the, of his case. So I won't go into too much detail, but essentially he's a serial rapist and murderer who was able to go about committing 
horrendous crimes for a long time without being caught. And then, because he buried all of his victims and then eventually was found and convicted. All of Tobin's former wives testified that they had suffered extreme violence at his hands. They noted that some of his violent behavior was brought on by their menstrual cycles, something that Mm. he may have in common with Bible John, as all three of his victims had been menstruating at the time of their murders. Yeah. So supporters of this theory believe that the crimes Tobin committed were too well executed to have been committed by an amateur, as many of his victims' bodies were not found until years after their murder. So perhaps his first forays into violent crime had been the Bible John murders, which were much less well hidden. On the flip side, you could also say that this shows a very different modus operandi, because the Bible John killer almost deliberately staged his victims' bodies, perhaps hoping they would be found, by displaying them in public places, which would be at odds with Tobin's habit of burying his victims. Yeah, I guess it fits with, though, with the concept of, like, if he disappears or stops killing, maybe he just gets good or decides yeah. that he wants to keep doing this and he doesn't want to get caught, so he's going to start being better at covering his tracks. Yeah. Gene Langford was certain that Tobin had not been the man in the taxi. So there's yeah, that. I guess that theory. Um, I guess if you have this very specific guy and they're saying he doesn't actually, that's not him, he doesn't look like him, then... I will say it's also like... One of the main difficulties of this case is that you've got one single person who's alive who's seen this person. And she saw him once, late at night. In a fleeting moment. In a, Yeah, in a moment where you wouldn't be like, I need to memorize this guy's face. Not to discredit her belief that Tobin is not this man. I'm just saying that it's like, there is so little for police to go off that... It's almost impossible to solve this case. Her certainty was supported by the police investigation. Tobin's DNA was not a match for Bible John's. Although I will say that apparently the DNA they had on file had been damaged at Mm. a certain point because it hadn't been well preserved. Um, But his dental records were not a match for the bite mark left on Helen's body. On top of that, Tobin was found to be elsewhere when the crimes were perpetrated. So on one occasion, he was on his honeymoon with his wife. So another person can confirm this alibi. On another, he was in police custody for an unrelated crime. And he was living in Brighton at the time of Helen's murder. So it would have been difficult for him to travel all the way to Glasgow and back without his wife noticing that he was gone for a significant amount of time. Yeah. This case ultimately remains unsolved. Investigators believe that family members or friends of the killer shielded him and didn't come forward with relevant information which severely hindered their investigation. And ultimately, as I was just saying, police were unable to pursue their investigation due to a lack of witnesses. As this was one of the most publicised investigations in the history of Scotland, this case has received a lot of attention and criticism directed towards the investigation itself and the media's coverage of the murders. So there is no actual consensus that the three crimes were committed by the same person, and people criticise the police for jumping to this conclusion as it may have hampered the investigation of each individual murder. Mm. Which is like, I don't know, some people believe that this was like a copycat killer. I guess, but I feel like that's less likely. Mm. Um, just there's just the details are too similar. I mean... Yeah, you can theorize that someone did one thing and then another person copied it. But that just, to me, that seems far less likely. Mm. I don't find it hard to believe that this is the work of a single person. Because there are so many similarities between these cases. But, you know, there's so little to confirm that. That I can also see how you would be like, well, what? how can you actually say that this is the same person? I've heard more dissimilar cases, like, though, like... I've heard serial killers who have done things that are more disparate mm. than the, the circumstances deeper. that link these mm. three together. And yet they're still linked. Yeah. Many also criticise the media's misogynistic coverage of the crimes as they heavily emphasise the scandalous nature of the murdered women being found naked. Um, and there was also an element of victim blaming, suggesting that it was these working class women's own fault that they had been murdered. So that's bullshit. Yeah. The police's decision to make the killer's psychological profile public has also been criticized. 
as it may have prevented people from naming someone in their entourage who did not fit all of the criteria exactly. So having like established this profile and then made it public, I think a lot of people would have been like, oh, well, like this guy I know who almost fits all of the criteria, but isn't someone I know to be hugely sadistic. Mm. Well, he can't be this guy. So like it sort of hindered more than it helped in a certain way because it limited the public's perception of who this person could be Mm. and the police's over-reliance on the single image resulting from gene langford's testimony may have also limited the investigation in particular their dismissal of any suspect who did not have crossed incisors is seen as quite flimsy by some people that does seem like a really small detail well, it's like, if that is the only thing that's stopping you from charging someone, I don't know. Yeah. But on the other hand, this, so they're really basing a lot of their uh, investigation on the perpetrator having this incredibly distinctive physical feature of these cross teeth. But this feature was not visible on the composite sketch that was made public because he's drawn with his mouth shut. Hmm. So it's at the same time they're really heavily relying on this but also this detail is not necessarily like put forward as Hmm. a characteristic that might be important to the public. So on both sides it just kind of doesn't work. But yeah, that's the case of Bible John. A lot of violence and unsolved questions in this case um yeah very interesting case i hadn't i mean i've heard, definitely heard of it you know I've, de- I've heard the but i actually hadn't known that much about it in detail i don't think it's crazy that they never caught that they never caught him but i guess at the time that was not unheard of it There's isn't no but DNA it's and unusual stuff like that. for a case you know this is probably one of the most famous cases in scottish history and you know everyone was talking about it looking for this guy the police were really doing their best to follow any lead that they possibly had Hmm. so it's unusual i would say for the the amount of attention it received for them not to have found anyone yeah who could have committed these crimes yeah it's there's also lots of parallels with you know like other things that happen not to not too far away time-wise and geography-wise like the Yorkshire Ripper Mm. and how that had a you know shone a light on how people saw women and Mm. female victims and the sort of lack of sympathy that many of them would get if like any part of their life seemed to be sort of out of I don't know out of step or they were not anything short of completely perfect wifely christian material but yeah very it's very sad yeah but it's like that's one of the main things that people criticize is that it sort of there was this huge attitude of like well these married women were going off and dancing well they were asking to be raped why would you want to have fun after you get married (laughs) (laughs) which is just like absurdly misogynistic Mm. well you've achieved marriage and you've had children so like what more do you want in life (laughs) we're obviously joking just in case that's not clear (laughs) only a harlot would ever want to move her body again (laughs) in public (laughs) so sort of hit a dead end with this case no it's called the end yeah (laughs) it's just because it's when it's a cold case you know you kind of just end on a... It's un- it can be unsatisfying. Like, there's not that feeling of closure. Mm. Well, if you know Bible John, call the police. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel at this point you, c- you should, you know, come forward with that information. I mean, I guess he could still be alive. Yeah, if he was, like, 25 in the late 60s, then he'd yeah. be, like, in his... 80s it's possible i think i'm i'm gonna go with died or moved away because well maybe died because Mm. the specific the specific nature of the crimes you think 
if he moved and continued to do the same things, which I believe he would have. Mm. Uh, but yet you never hear... I mean, unless he went to a country where, you know, maybe this just wasn't yeah. the infrastructure to un- to sort of deal with it. But I think we might have seen him crop up. But mm. if and if he goes to prison, a lot of the time you get someone, you get like informant situations where like you talk to someone in prison and they do not keep your you know this is the eventually thing. these people end up confessing to someone in prison and that person tells someone and that's how a lot of people get yeah caught in the end based on the so description I feel like of maybe the he died. evening he spent with gene and helen is like this is a guy who likes the sound of his own voice he likes to talk mm. about his upbringing and how he's so like mightier than thou yeah and he's so religious like if this guy was incarcerated he would be telling someone. I, I just get so. the feeling that yeah. he'd be ta- he'd be displaying behavior odd enough that that person would be like would notify the police at some point. I don't think he would have. He has got. Th- he would have managed to get through life without exposing himself. So mm. that's why I think he might have died in some way. Um, mm. and that could be anything. That also kind of explains, yeah, how he suddenly seems to drop off the face of the earth. You can also be triggered, perhaps, to book, to start doing crimes like this because of something like maybe a terminal diagnosis. Yeah, like you, you know, know that... If you know you're going to die, maybe that triggers you... Triggers to violent just act behavior. In a, yeah. I don't know, but... Um, my theory... Hmm. I think that seems plausible. As plausible as anything else you could <laughs> think for this case. Thank you for listening to this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel on whatever platform you listen to these. Um, for this episode, I watched the BBC Scotland documentary, The Hunt for Bible John, which I would definitely recommend if you're interested in learning I watch more that now. about this case. Yeah. It's pretty short as well. It's like an hour and a half, maybe. Hmm. So I would definitely recommend it. And it gives a lot of like a lot of key figures uh, involved in the case sort of speak about the investigation. And it also gives you a lot of uh, historical context for Glasgow in the 60s and 70s, which is quite illuminating in some ways. So we're also on social media. If you would like to connect with us there, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, We're on Instagram at a podcast about murder. And on Facebook, it's a podcast about murder with no E. Uh, we're also on YouTube. If you search for us there, you'll find us. And you can always send us an email at a podcast about murder at outlook.com. And don't forget to rate rate five stars. Of course. Only five. <laughs> it's the only number that exists for us. <laughs> well, with that, we'll see you next week for episode five.